Hello, welcome. Hello, yes. Welcome everyone to This Week in Mormons. I am Daniel Yanez and... I'm Daniel Ferreira and we're happy to be here again. We're back. Uh, woo! Yes. No, Twim strikes back. Uh, well, I guess our episode from a month ago wasn't that terrible uh, to the point that we were asked to return. So you're going to have to deal with our accents and with our comments once again. But we, we got some 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 really nice nice feedback from some listeners. We really appreciate that, that at least some of you enjoyed the previous discussion and the topics that we covered. And we are thrilled to be with you again. So how's it going for you, Danny? How's this month? Very good. Uh, we're enjoying summer by this time of the year here, and it's uh, wonderful. I've been talking to family in Chile, and then they're enjoying hard winter. So I think yeah. it's one of the interesting things about living in this side of the world, right? So It's the polar opposite, literally. So how are you finding the <laughs> summer there in upstate New York compared to Chile? Very hot and, and humid, but nice. I mean, it's, oh. it's just a, a good time of the year uh, compared to the harsh winter we we experienced last year so i think it's it's all good and welcome to have some vitamin d uh, and then enjoy uh hotter days and then you know <laughs> being around uh, play with the kids and yeah you gotta that. take advantage yeah. yeah take advantage of that sunshine like there's nothing more uk than when we have a little bit of sunshine in the spring in the summer uh people go out to their gardens you know to the backyards and just get their uh, kind of uh a beach uh, chairs and they just start sunbathing, you know, in the in the garden. <laughs> it's a very UK thing. You know, you've been to UK okay. if you have seen somebody do that. Uh, I haven't done it though. Uh, I stay true to my, my South American values, I guess. <laughs> but but yeah, we had a pretty nice uh, late spring, early summer here. Uh, probably too nice. Last week in a church, the chapel was super super hot. It was like thirty degrees Celsius. Which for the listeners in the U.S. in Fahrenheit, how much is that? Like ninety Fahrenheit. Ninety uh, probably. Yeah. Yeah, around eighty that. something. And, yeah. But, but but you guys over there, you have aircon or as they call it here, AC in the U.S. Air conditioning. Yeah, AC. Right? Yeah. Yes. Well, guess what? We don't have that here. I, I guess it, it doesn't. It didn't make sense in the past. I guess to build buildings and you know build chapels and homes with AC units for maybe using it twice a year or so. Yeah, sure. Now, we're seeing temperatures change and becoming more and more of a need. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, maybe in the future we'll see that upgraded, but it was rough. <laughs> but then you, you have heating, right? What you don't have is yeah, air we conditioning. Do have heating. Okay. Yeah, okay. it's just the, okay. the air con. Yeah, and the humidity okay. over there, Danny, is it like really bad? Or? Between 70 to 90, probably. Yeah, oh. percent. So, is it like so if you're like in a cold air conditioned room and you walk, walk outside middle of the day do your glasses get like all foggy and that that level or yes not as much? yes yes you, yeah. you get the kick you get the kick <laughs> yeah. outside of of the heat and the humidity yeah yeah, yeah. it reminds crazy. me of my mission even i mean in in colombia ah, certain in, in barranquilla then yeah it was very very humid 90 percent humidity most of the time so Oof. it was very very tough yeah, yeah. Very sweaty very... yeah sweat the caribbean in coast. every yeah <laughs> at every level <laughs> Yes. Uh, no. No, for me, my mission was my mission prepared me for the UK. Because I serve in southern Chile, you know, all rainy. <laughs> and yeah. the summers Humid. were nice, yeah. but also it could rain anytime. And that's exactly what it's like here in northern London. Well, in St. Albans where I am, it's actually outside of London. But uh yeah, that that's cool. So So we... Danny, th there yeah. there's the interesting news I think for this weekend. Uh it would be nice to to cover some of them. Uh, I would like to start with the Joseph Smith papers. I think one of the most interesting things about it is that it's finally finished. Uh, interesting facts, 20 years of work, right? 27 volumes. Uh, the last volume, it's called uh, Documents Volume 15. So that 15. means that even though there are 27 volumes, uh, they were compiled into 15 volumes in the end, right? And the presentation was made by Elder Vetner, and then he was also uh, with Elder Gong and Elder Kyle McKay, 
who is uh, serving as the church historian and recorder. Oh, and know. the two interesting names that came uh, and participated in this uh, uh, presentation was Gail Miller, who is actually the current owner of Utah Yas. So one interesting element about about something that, of course, as, as non-American, <laughs> is the fact that there is also a, a segment of wealthy members of the church that are very, you know, active and 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 hands on uh, church yeah. projects right uh I, I don't know if you if you remember this uh urban myth that um <laughs> which one the Mary the marriotts uh, gave one of the church presidents an airplane because okay. church leaders uh, kind of traveled by plane but then of course they had to accept all the different you know changes in flights and 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 circumstances and and whatnot uh, while this uh Elder Merritt, I think, uh, he gave uh, out uh, an airplane for the church, for the church leadership. So the church prison shouldn't have to use commercial flights, hmm. right? So I don't know if it's true. I, I mean, I'm just saying that that's the urban myth I heard. But the interesting thing here <laughs> is uh, putting your money to the service in a way, right? Putting up a portion, a small portion of your of your, of your your assets, of your wealth for, for church purposes, which poses an interesting perspective in terms of uh, would we do it, right? Like hmm. if, if I have money enough and I'm a tithing uh, payer, right? Should I put part of my wealth for the service of the church, for the expanding of the church mission and and to help others, to serve others? What, what's what's your, your, your thought yeah, about that? It, it took an interesting turn because when you mentioned, yeah, the, the completion of the of the Joseph Smith papers, the first thing that came to mind is I haven't read a single sentence from any <laughs> of, of them, uh, which okay. I don't know, makes me feel a little bit uh, embarrassed. But but at the same time, that, that doesn't take away the fact that I personally feel super grateful that the church, you know, two decades ago embarked into um, into this endeavor of kind of secularly engaging in our church history which we know that for many people is something they're really passionate about and for many other people is a big stumbling block because of uh, us being also continuously learning about our church history and, and many topics that are difficult to process through the lens of how we were taught many things about church history or about the gospel, right? So the fact that, yeah. that that's being made available with a high rigor uh, from an academic standpoint and all of that even if I haven't read a single word of it, it, it does reassure me that we're not shying away from from addressing those things. And, and maybe I would hope that we would find ways to make better use of it. Uh, or maybe at, uh, in our uh, worship or something. I don't uh, know how. Uh, but I, be, I be, love... before, be, before that, yes. I just wanted to say why a different turn is that I had no idea about how this was funded. Uh, and uh, I think that's an interesting point of discussion, though. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to. Yeah, so I, I love the fact that you mentioned that we're not shying away. That's the first thing, and I think it's it's critical for any uh, standpoint, right? Then the second perspective I, I get from it is that now that I'm getting into this uh, PhD mindset, um, theory, right, and, and applications sometimes feel a little bit uh, divorced, right? Because theory is is the way we we, we ideally expect things should be. And then uh, the application is how things actually are and then how a good theory can replicate uh, the practice, right? So based on yeah. that, for some, for some of us, right, we got this uh, pre-processed, um, clean-cut church history, which is okay, right, for, for, for instructional purposes. But then church mm -hmm. history involves people and people are not black and white, right? Who are in a, de in degrees of shade, in degrees of yeah, we, sh shade, right? Which represents in a way, uh, the importance of understanding all these particulars, all the nuances of, of different interactions between humans, right? And what the church is doing by, by using the Joseph Smith's papers is just to gather all the available da data they had and just to try to compile it in such a way that we're all understanding all this 
specifics, right? All these circumstances, all these interactions in a more deeper, comprehensive, and of course, uh, uh, wider picture. Because then again, right, for instructional purposes, it's okay to have uh, a a predetermined, uh, very linear history. But we all know that humanity hasn't been like that ever, right? So even though... uh, even though it's, again, I think it's okay for instructional purposes, but then to have all this uh, rich, uh, very colorful and, and in-depth, detailed uh, story, then we can clearly understand more yeah. and also get to, to, I don't know how to explain it, but to uh, savor, right, all mm-hmm. this particular yeah. things. I mean, we all understand uh, Joseph was upon, young. Feasting. Yeah, yeah, feast upon. Jo- Joseph was young. Um, he just started a family. He wasn't an educated person. And then we have all this specifics that makes us understand that for for sure, it wasn't easy. And then making uh, uh, uncalled mistakes or, or maybe making impromptu decisions just because the situation required it. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that he wasn't a, a prophet called from God, right? So I, I always like to, to see him as a human. And then also this human was called to serve. And because he was called to serve, then uh, he mm-hmm. was instructed to do certain things. But as a human, sometimes these things get in the middle, right? So, and, and, and I'm sure that these documents should help us get to that humanity, right? I'll, to give the listeners a bit of a sense of scale, in the article, it says more than 600 people have worked on the project at various times over the last 22 years. So a big shout out to anybody that was involved in this. And then it says um, it represents a hundred, sorry, uh, 1,300 journal entries, more than 600 letters, 155 revelations, a nearly 19,000 pages, more than 7 million words, 50,000 footnotes. Like it's it's massive. The scale of this is it's massive. So uh, a huge endeavor and... And I think to close on the on the point about the funding, I think that merits a whole episode <laughs> to, to discuss. Yeah. My views is that I, I do appreciate that members that are, uh, um, you know, that have achieved a great wealth status, are putting their resources uh, to to work for the benefit of of the work. I think that that's always welcome. Uh, it does leave the lingering question that I would avoid getting into now because I could go on for hours. <laughs> of yeah. is is it kind of ethically right to 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 live in a society that that allows that to happen or should we drive for a more equitable uh, society but that's probably a topic for a different podcast <laughs> we'll leave it at that <laughs> uh one, one last thing on this one uh from a fact checking standpoint i checked and it looks like the millers were owners of the Utah jazz or were somehow involved but i fact checked because i know that now uh, i think it's ryan smith who used to be by the way my boss for a few months years ago when I worked for his startup back then. Now his huge company oh, wow. called Qualtrics. Uh, he's the current owner of the Utah Jazz. So um, okay, yeah. years ago yeah. when nobody knew him, I, I I used to have lunch with him, and I don't think he remembers me now. So because now he's a billionaire. Okay, <laughs> speaking of billionaires, yeah, big shout out. Yeah, yeah, interesting, very very interesting. Great. So yes, thanks. Uh, Should we I, I move think on that... to the? Ne- oh, sorry. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. I, I just wanted to to add up to the fact that uh, it's my my perspective is that it's good if if you have the access to to that kind of wealth and resources to put them in in this interesting projects that will benefit thousands, if not millions, of people. So yeah, and I think it's I'm happy about with, it. With, regardless of the of the nature of our societies and economies. Putting that aside, we've still made covenants that, uh, for many of us, involve consecration, right? And and I think this is a, a great way to to put and that to work to for serve, those that right? have that access. Yes, and to serve and yeah. to to you know bear each other's burdens and all that that we read in the Book of Mormon and in other places. So I agree with you, Danny. Great way to to wrap that up. We have another one moving on to a more international news, and you probably heard about this uh, in other episodes on, on this podcast or, or elsewhere. But uh, this uh, hits home because it's about the Tabernacle Choir and their time in Mexico, which 
uh, was it's like home in Mexico is just yeah northern the rest of South America and then yeah it's yeah <laughs> even though we are what four thousand miles Very further far. south <laughs> uh, I know yeah. that for many people it's one and the same and we don't take offense it's fine but yeah the one thing is common though and it's language and about this one uh, so that uh, as you know for the first time in in decades the Tabernacle Choir went to Mexico. I, uh, I didn't know that it had been that long. Uh, and they they performed, I think it was a live stream that they did a couple of weeks ago with a number of artists and t media personalities from Mexico, etc. It was really well, well attended. But I'll share about this. And I don't know if you've seen any of this, Danny, yourself. But No, not I, at all. Yeah, so I came across this on Instagram, maybe about two weeks ago when it was first aired. And it was a story where, well, two of them. I'll start with the, the more spiritual one first. One, okay. it was uh, the, the Tabernacle Choir singing uh, God be with you till we meet again, or in Spanish, oh, para siempre dear. Dios esté con vos. But in Spanish, so para oh. siempre Dios esté con vos. And you know yeah. what? I, I wasn't expecting that. It was like a Monday morning, getting ready for work, maybe a bit sleepy, mm -hmm. and I had my my, you know, my AirPods and, and it popped up and I, I saw that it was a 15 second story. And just like that, it brought something that felt special, but in a different way, not, not just the spirit of, the, of that lovely music and what it represents, but hearing it in Spanish for the first time, this Mark Wilber arrangement that it, it just felt very, very different. And it really moved me. Like, I, I don't think, I, I don't know if I, it brought tears to my eyes, but certainly uh, at, at an emotional level, it moved some, some, some things happened, you know, emotionally to okay. me that I was not expecting, especially given the context of kind of being on the go, getting ready to take my kids to school. And then I kept, kept browsing for, for other, other stories where they were singing this arrangements that I grew up with, uh, that I grew up even kind of, uh, trying to transcribe and, and sing with state choirs back in the early 2000s in Chile when I was kind of finishing my young men years, but now sung in my language. And that, that was really, really nice. Uh, so yeah, that was the first yeah. one, the first comment that, that I had. That moves. I mean, people, people don't understand, I think, uh, for, for us non-English speaking people, how powerful it is to, to hear things in our native language, because we've been used to, you know, listen to these things in English or general conference, right? I mean, even though there's translation and everything, it's kind of new. It's kind of new because historically we, we got everything in English. I mean, uh, yeah. so based on that, when, when you hear these arrangements and, and this uh, special feeling that you get from a choir, different from, from someone singing by him or herself, is how powerful it becomes when, when you have a big group of powerful voices, right, coming together and 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 singing the the hymns you, you you got to love while you were growing up in your own language. Yeah. Right. So it's I, and I think it goes back else. scripturally, right, where in Doctrine and Covenants ninety three, I think it is. I might be wrong. Fact check me, listeners. Where it says that <laughs> every person would hear the the gospel preached to them in their own language, right, and that they're uh, it's it's there. I remember back in would have been 2014 or 2015 when we had those two odd general conferences when non-native English speakers gave their talks in their native language. That was super nice. One of them was uh, actually my mission president, uh, President Ceballos, uh, who's now in the 70. And it was really nice to hear him because he's from Chile as well. So it was not just Spanish, but it was like Chilean Spanish with stories that were local. And, and, and that was really nice. And I think it's a shame that we didn't see it come back, uh, right? But the, this Tabernacle Choir presentation brought that back to me and kind of meant a lot to me. I, I was, and I'm pretty sure that not just for Mexico saints, but any Spanish speaker, and I hope by extension for others, uh, as I hope this gets replicated as the, the choir tours the rest of the world, I hope it, it means uh, something to them uh, as well. Yeah, and, and I think Spanish-speaking um, artists are are great, you know, and and then th th that's another interesting uh, perspective we, we can we can consider yeah, here. Yeah, I was I was, uh, I was looking that there were quite a few. I don't know if they are Mexican artists, all of them, but there was yes, a singer so. of, that that voiced Dolores in Encanto in the Disney movie. 
It's yes. a song, La Vida es un Carnaval. That's a Celia Cruz song. So that's like a Cuban yes. salsa music. Uh, what else do we have? Ah, that's the, the second story that I was going to tell you is that among those Instagram stories that popped up, uh, there was a Diego Torres song. So for listeners, Diego Torres, is, is he Argentinian, I think? Yes, uh, Argentinian here. He's singer, Argentinian. pop pop singer from very big in the late nineties, early two thousands, and this song that was like everywhere back then in two thousand three. I remember my senior year in high school uh, was um, Esperanza. I don't know if it's called that. Um, color Esperanza. Uh, color Esperanza. Yeah. Uh, yes. The color of hope. I guess our translation in English. Yes. And that's a song. I. It's a very hopeful song, but and it's kind of an earworm. But because it's an earworm. I don't like it. Like I, I'm like oh, I don't. It gets yeah, stuck sure. straight away. It's like <laughs> very like corny. I can't take it and, from and my head. Other, yes. Yeah, and that was the other story that popped up, like and the choir like singing. So I was like, what is this? <laughs> um, it was lovely though. It was just it took me t some time to, to process. There was some cognitive dissonance where it's like these two worlds are colliding, and my brain is not yes. making sense of it. I don't know if you saw that one. No, 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 no. Yeah, it was it was good, and the, the and I'm not planning one, to see it yet. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I mean it, it's fine, and you know what? I do recognize uh, as a musician as well. Those that are watching a video, you can see the this is like my music corner in my son's bedroom. Uh, as a musician, I, I grew up with with some biases, uh, having grown up especially in the early two thousands, where I've never seen kind of the world of pop and rock and kind of popular music blending really well with kind of worship music. And that's pure prejudice, right? Because I think our fellow fellow Christians in other denominations they really nail that. But I always and, kind and of they do it, yeah. yeah, they do yeah. it pretty well, yeah, surprisingly well, yes, incredibly well. Last year I went to the Nam show in California. That that's the biggest trade show for musical instruments in the world, and I work in in that trade. Um, and there was this um, I don't remember which church, uh, but it was like a worship group. Uh, in one of the biggest stages, the Yamaha stage in in the Anaheim's uh, Anaheim Convention Center, where the the event took place, and the guys were the best musicians I've seen in, in my life. Life period. Like even Chris <laughs> Cornell, one of my big heroes in rock music, that was the best concert I've been to in my life. But these were the best musicians I've seen live, and they really nail it. And there's a tradition of 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 that blend of popular music and worship that I grew up kind of making fun of, and now I regret it because I really like. I feel like I no longer have have those biases, you know, in my conscience. But in my subconscious, I still do <laughs> because when I see things yeah. like this, and, and, and you really don't have the capacity me. to 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 enjoy it. Like, yeah, because yeah, it, the th the same happens to me in, in in a in a similar way is the fact that yeah, I, I yeah, I don't like churches singing popular songs. I don't know, even yeah. from Disney, it's like oh, this is weird. I, I, I mean. Even though it might sound beautiful and it could be an, a very interesting thing to do, I kind of not like it. And yeah. and it's probably again this bias that I, I grew up with, and there's nothing I can do at this point in my life. I, I'm just trying to avoid feeling that way, right? But but it's just yeah, it's probably us. It's probably that we're too old, Danny. <laughs> probably yeah, the, the newer yeah, generations true. will do better than than we do. But in general, I think that uh, it's it's great to see the the church deliberately going out there and especially something as flagship as the tabernacle choir uh going around the world i do have some and maybe as a follow-up discussion for the future but moving 300 people or so assuming that they move the entire choir it's quite a big endeavor and quite expensive and lots of resources so i think there are some overtones worth at least acknowledging that look is it scalable? Is it something that we want to do, or is there uh, is there another way that we can promote kind of local cultural expressions within our faith that that are more sustainable and, and actually that that are that have a better long term impact other than than this? Uh, I don't know. I think it's worth letting that simmer in our in our minds uh, as we discuss this. I think that I think at least from from the perspective of the talent and the willingness to do it, I think members in their local communities are more than willing to do it. It's just the fact that you need a, a more structured kind of setting and then to be honest also the motivation if you yeah. if we think of this as a as a church endeavor and then the church decides to I don't know to help local 
national choirs in different locations, yeah. then this uh, worldwide calling to to serve or or to participate in a in a local choir at a professional level yeah. could be or could have a higher impact than rather just having the stake choir for the state conference or or or, or the ward choir yeah. for for the ward you know conference is it's kind of different yeah. again it, in terms of the external motivation you can put up on, and i and it. i hope that's yeah. the long term impact as well i think i think the that the inspiring kind of effect of their visit and hopefully their future visits really lingers because they're uh, like i i was from a generation that didn't have this opportunity as and as a musician growing up in the church a lot of my devotion a lot of my worship went in the form of music as i said before like trans transcribing arrangements by ear of of mac wilbur and the tabernacle choir because we back then we didn't have access to buying them online or anything like we, we just had to do it the old school way and we were participating in my brother and i uh, in this uh, choir that was kind of like the city church choir. It was not an official church choir, but we would sing in, in events in the Santiago Temple for Christmas, for Easter. That's where I met my wife, actually, uh, in, in my late teens. Uh, that's where your wife uh, my, and your sister-in-law, you know, my brother's wife, they, they met there. Like, we can all trace kind of our current lives to worshiping through music in a very scrappy way in Chile. And I hope that now that the Tabernacle Choir is going out there, it will inspire further generations and help professionalize kind of those efforts that, you know, 20 years ago we were just doing on the fly. <laughs> yeah, and, and also getting people together, you know, because after the pandemic, I think that there's a, a, a very powerful need to, to get people together physically, right? Mm. Uh, not only through, through media, but, but also through, through opportunities where they can do things together and, and then they can get to know each other better. And and that will certainly benefit future generations. That, that's that's for sure. I, I I have no doubt about it. So, indeed, Danny. Uh, Next one. What about the the UK safeguarding standards? I'm I'm okay. curious about it. And 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 I have one. Uh, it, at least my my opinion is that it's critical. It's essential that that we we pay more attention to these things even from the small things of uh, going with your children to the restroom in a conference, right? Or in yeah. in a church meeting, not because it's dangerous, but just because your children shouldn't be alone. I mean, even if you go to a playground, there is a, always a like a, an information document that says uh, children should be, you know, Overseen, supervised, uh, supervised yeah. right? Uh, while we are here, right? So mm -hmm. I, I, I think it translates perfectly to to the church setting. We all know yeah. that you go to church and church is a safe place and all, but church is an open space also, so anyone can yeah. come in. Visitors welcome, right? That's yes, in, in our yeah. whole meeting houses. So yeah, way to shift gears as well from singing to, to this topic, but but it's it's an interesting one. There's an article from uh, what is it called Religion News Service by Jana Rice. I, I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing her name right. She's a journalist that focuses on a lot of church topics, and it gives an interesting angle, and that I got to see at least a, a part of it as a current bishop here in the UK. And it says British Mormons lobby for stricter, stricter safeguards against abuse and succeed. So uh, we won't go into to the detail of, of, of the article, but I think that's an interesting angle to consider, to give kind of the Sparknotes version of what happened. The, the Europe North Area Presidency on 20th of June 2023 shared a letter with a local and area leaders in, in the area applicable to the UK. That, that includes England, Scotland, uh, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Uh, upgrading, or not upgrading, but updating safeguarding policies and procedures. And it includes amongst uh, other kind of local implementation of stake and safeguarding specialist leaders to be called and, and things like that. It, it introduces also mandatory DBS checks DBS stands for Disclosure and Bearing Service. That's a kind of the UK name for a background check. A background in check. Okay. And uh, to ensure uh, and to check that those that are serving with children, youth, or, or vulnerable adults uh, are, are qualified to do so. 
uh, and ensuring that individuals with a history of violent or abusive behavior are not allowed to work with vulnerable people. And, and a number of other things, that, that's probably the most notable thing. There are already many standards that are implemented uh, worldwide you know, for, for the protection of children and youth, uh, but this adds, uh, kind of raises the bar in the UK significantly, and this is going or, or to puts, be... Uh, uh, I, I was thinking that, that it provides a second layer of protection, if, if, if that is the, 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 the feeling, yeah. you know, because I think the church is doing good things about it. I, I don't think it, it's the church is neglecting uh, any of, of these elements on, on the country. I think the church has always done this with the, with the most important, you know, um, yeah, prioritizing. Yeah. 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 Pr pr prioritizing. So I, I think that most of the time we just think that uh, it should be doing more which is reasonable. And then when we're thinking of our own children, of course, uh, nothing is enough, right? But, but again, my, my perception initially is that you're, you're never expecting that these things or bad things are going to happen in a church building. And, and because of that positive expectation, then you start to, to put these layers of protection just to make sure that a basic you know, standards are, are covered. And yeah. then this suggested second layer of protection, uh, it's also relevant and necessary just for the sake, again, of the of the children and just for the sake of, of, of the innocent. And, and, and I yeah. think it's critical to see it in that perspective because uh, if in the past uh, the church has been, I don't know, relaxed, maybe, if that could be an expression for this, uh, again, I don't think it was because uh, they decided not to do something about it. It's just because you're not expecting bad things are going to happen in, uh, it's in a, a church. Yeah, it's that, and, and that applies on, on other levels, you know, that are kind of less critical probably, but, you know, that, that trust that is kind of granted uh, automatically as a church community to each other, you know, has led to issues of, you know, people being, uh, what's the word? You know, when you get into like, a, oh, I'm forgetting my English words now, uh, uh, you know, in kind of financial in some, uh, constraints. No, no, no. When, when no? somebody takes advantage of you financially and with a with a business and, you know, oh. because you, you trust your counterpart, uh, you know, and somebody takes advantage of you uh, just because, you know, you gave them that trust because of your fellow church members. No church members. Uh, again, yeah. I'm forgetting the English words now. Apologies. Thanks for, for referring with us. Now, in this case, it's similar. I think we don't expect bad things to happen at church, but they can, and actually they do. And, and actually that expectation can le lead us to kind of have very, kind of, uh, to let our guard down, in other words. And, and these deliberate measures to raise the bar and to ensure that they're there, I think it's great. Something that I've seen personally is that this is part of a wider cultural change from, from with, within the church and the wider community in general of what to expect. I've seen many members within my own congregation, my, my own kind of a, the local church community that are very cognizant and very aware of safeguarding standards. You know, they, they either have an experience because they work in education or other places where, where this is also a, a huge topic. But many others are completely oblivious to the fact that this is not just a thing, but that this is super important and why it's it's in place. I remember years ago when we were introducing the too deep rule for um, you know primary lessons or for uh, carpooling with children and things like that. I wouldn't say that there was a hard pushback to it, but the, a lot of the reaction was like, "But why do we even need that?" Right? A lot of people kind yeah. of not not seeing why, and and I think we're in the middle of a, of an ever increasing. Of uh, change, you know, paradigm shift amongst church members, and and these deliberate measures, I think, are the right thing to speed it up, so, so that we're all in alignment. So that you know, if if a parent, you know, needs to bring some somebody to one of their children to a youth activity, and uh, unfortunately, leaders cannot go pick them up because we cannot meet the too deep rule. You know that there's no frustration on their part that they, they understand. You know, that we're all, all in the same boat, and it's not that leaders are not willing to. To do that, but it's for the protection of their own children, right? But it took some time. Yeah, it took some time, and and all the ones that have served with children or youth then know that they go through the training program, and then uh, you have to redo the training every two years, kind of thing. And then again, I think it makes a lot of sense. 
uh, we're, we all agree on, on the fact that it's relevant, it's needed, it makes a lot of sense, and then whichever else the church can do in, in this space, I think is welcome, and, and we should embrace it, and we should try also to to let others know the importance of, of, of abiding to this mm -hmm. uh, procedures, right, to, 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 to these standards in such a way that we protect ourselves and we protect children. I think it's it also aligns with, with the missionary work, right? Like it's like the the white book, right? When, the white when book. you had all this rule, yeah, you you have the general missionary rules, and then each mission will have some specific set of rules or or a specific set set of procedures, just because experience has taught us that it's better, right? That is a better idea to follow them or to to about abide to these uh, standards. And yeah. and again, the, the whole purpose out of it is just to protect, right? Yeah, the and of course, these uh, these are, you know, we're human, and church leaders are human as well. And I'm sure that these standards are bound to be upgraded and adjusted as we go. But but we need to to put them in place. I want to close on this one with what I teased at the very beginning, which is the the title of this news article, uh, which is how these policies came about to materialize, and there is an organization that in, in the UK was set up by some members that were bringing up this issue to church leaders regarding requiring background checks and and and, and other measures for kind of higher bar in, in training leaders uh, to to prevent uh, abuse that and, and they became very active on it. They formed an organization called, um, let me look at it here, uh, 21st Century saints they even launched a podcast oh, yeah. etc started to create content and they took a kind of an activist approach to it which based on not so recent but also recent history has been problematic for members that have embarked in, in kind of similar activist type uh, approaches to to drive change uh, at a general church level there's one case uh, that, that is notorious i think and i don't know if it's arizona or in, in that area regarding uh, requesting high standards for interviewing people, you know, and bishops not being alone with youth and, and all of yes. that, that all of those changes have been implemented. But unfortunately, the, the, the church member that initiated much of that ended up being, uh, um, the, his membership ended up being removed, as we call it now, or was excommunicated, communicated. how we used to, to call this, right? And and there's a, also a, a culture of avoiding this topic. This, yeah, I don't know if it's the topics, but the, the approach of challenging the church organization church for the, organization. the way thing, they're handling certain things. For many people, I would say for the majority of, of church members and even leaders, that is a big no-no. You know, it probably comes from from the from this notion of the church being uh, you know, the truth claims that we have about the church being true and about revelation and, and all of that. And we kind of let that percolate into every corner of kind of church policy, which we know is not necessarily the case. It's a living church, living things adjust and evolve. And, evolve. And, yeah. Yes. And, and, and they have defects as well, right? The, the, you know, my body is a living organism and let me tell you, it has a lot of defects. <laughs> it's not perfect, right? yes. Yeah. So it's not perfect. Uh, yes. But and, and I also see the other side where taking an activist stance can uh Without the, the right intentions or the, the the right approach, can quickly delve into uh, enmity, right? In, into into becoming uh, you know somebody that that is just going after the institution because of just because emotion, yeah, just because or either emotional reasons or, or, or things like that. And many, especially people that no longer believe, they may have good reason to to be activists, and, and that's completely fine. But this middle ground, where many of us might identify ourselves with, of yeah, I, I recognize the church as uh, and its truth claims, but I also recognize the fact that we're part of it and, and that we should contribute and, and give feedback. Uh, that there's not much space for that, and I think this particular case sets a great precedent that members can do that and can feel safer about it because rather than these members kind of falling into a process of church discipline or things like that because they're kind of challenging the the brethren or their local or area leaders area leaders engage with them and ended up taking on much of, of their proposals into 
these standards. And, and from what I read in the article, you know, one of the sisters that was involved in it was called as a stake specialist to lead on this. It's much All of their changes, surprise according yes. to the, the narrative in the article. And for me, that sets an incredibly positive precedent about how we as members can and should engage with our church leaders in a way that produces good fruit. And at the end of the day, that's what Jesus taught, that by their fruits, we shall know them, right? And, and I think the yes. fruit that we're seeing here, not just the new policy, but the process that led to it, that was very high risk for, for these members based on precedent, ended up giving good fruit. And I'm thrilled by that. And I hope that this happens everywhere. <laughs> That's my last word uh, about it. Awesome. Awesome. I, I, I love that. I, yeah, Great. I, I absolutely agree with, with, with the... I'm with glad the you steps did. that were taken, yes, and the yeah. steps that were taken in order to to make this happen, right? So in yeah, time, it's just a matter of of how you approach these things and how you you help the church understand the importance of them, right? So yeah. sometimes it's just the way you communicate. Most yeah. of the time, it's just that, right? Great. Next so, one. We have uh, more lo local. Let's go local. Sure. Go okay, ahead. Okay. Let's go. Let's go local. So uh, this is kind of a funny story. Uh, <laughs> in Chile, there are uh, different uh, TV channels. We all know that after this omni-channel uh, media, TV channels are having a hard time, right? Uh, TV sets are expensive. They, they, they uh, need a lot of space. And then because TVs are, TV shows or TV channels are not that popular anymore, because of the internet boom and yeah. I don't know influencers and and different sources, even podcasts. It's on right? their way out. Uh, it, TVs are on the way out and TV TV channels, and and unless they they do very high quality uh, content and then and or identify an interesting niche where they can um, do their thing, it's just increasingly difficult to find sponsors and and people you know. Um, investing heavily on them so they can continue running. So yeah. because of that, um, uh, one of the Chilean TV channels called La Red, The Net, the right? Net. Uh, the Net um, decided to, to rent the spaces in order to, to survive the financial crisis they're going through. So uh, interestingly enough, uh, there was a, during last week, there was a, an article in in a very popular kind of yellowish uh, tabloid, yeah. right? If we think of Tablo UK, tabloid level, yeah, yeah, tabloid level uh, outlet that is called uh, Polimetro, where they presented this idea that uh, La Red, the, the TV channel, channel uh, decided to rent the space to the church, to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, which is again surprising because uh, you start to speculate what is going to happen here. You know, uh, are we going to have a new I don't know, uh, Book of Mormon <laughs> uh, series with local uh, yeah, uh, what, indigenous what? Uh, native uh, Chilean Indian tribes, right? Uh, representing or portraying Nephi or, uh, I don't know, the Lamanite <laughs> or, or, or whatever, right? Or are yeah. we going to see, I don't know. Uh, Maybe we get videos. finally uh, uh, new temple videos. Played by yes. local actors who, who by knows. local actors, yes. I and love the speculation, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe, maybe I don't know uh, uh, videos about uh local leaders or or local stories, right? Uh, portrayed mm. by by their own or or by local again actors and actresses. But what we see in the article is interesting because uh, Elder Spencer from the 70s, from from some area, of the Italy, of the, right. Yeah. Or is yes, he... he's an area 70. Oh, area. Okay. He's an area 70. And then he explains that the church is intending to produce some uh, local videos for, for young adults. And uh, I think it's interestingly interesting enough to, to mention that it's great to see the church, uh, you know, using yeah. all the available resources and opportunities, right, to... I mean, it seems like a case of uh, this media organization in financial trouble, a church that happens to have the means now, we're in a period of uh, open prosperity, as we know, 
and yes. just benefited from from each other. Uh, and I, and I know this this TV channel they have really good infrastructure as well. This last summer when I went to Chile, I stayed in an Airbnb right across the street from from this uh, from the studios for for this TV channel. I, I could see and it's huge. All that. It's massive. It's a big campus, and yeah. uh, I'm looking forward to see what what they do. I hope we get some content in Spanish that. It's more localized, and that's not to say that the content that we generally get is it, it, not right or anything. But going back to the discussion about the Tabernacle Choir, right? Maybe this is an opportunity to engage local artists and and create content that that kind of uh, that feels that closer to home high, for members. Yeah, and that aligns with the high quality we're used to from 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 church headquarters, right? And yeah. also. We can we can use the means that are available in our local communities, so everyone is uh, invited, or you know, uh, the ones that are able to participate uh, it will be easier for them just to to do so, right? So I think yeah. it's, yeah, it's it's a good one, cool. and I and I know that in Chile and I think in the rest of the South America South area, the area presidency has been quite proactive in engaging with local media to broadcast general conference, to to put out kind of Christmas messages and things like that. Um, I, I don't know the details, but at least on my WhatsApp group that I have with uh, fellow kind of former missionaries from my mission, we have a very vibrant WhatsApp group. For those in the US that don't, don't know what WhatsApp is, it's like the biggest messaging app in the world that just happens not to be using the US nearly as much. But yeah, we have this huge group with like 30 or 40 missionaries from my 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 mission and every Christmas or every general conference, they're sharing the link to La Red, like this TV channel or other channels that are broadcasting general conference. And that was not the case back in my day there. So, so that, that. that means that there was a longstanding uh, relationship or service uh, relationship with, with, with the, the TV channel. So it was easier for the church just to say, well, let's rent for a couple of months the facilities and then let's produce some local uh, yeah. You know, content, and then we're all good, and we're all benefiting from it. Yeah, the article doesn't seem to state for how long this lease is, but we hope it's something long term, and that we see great stuff coming out of that. So you were talking about mission, former missionary, uh, yeah, fellows, and communication, and one big, 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 probably the biggest, I think, probably the biggest news this week, this week. was the fact that. That preach my gospel uh, revisited, right? <laughs> yeah. Volume two is out, and you can get it in your local newspaper stand, or no, no, <laughs> or, or whatever. Yeah. yeah, the amazing preach but, my gospel. This is like the remake yes. of Spider Man. This, this is <laughs> yeah. the amazing preach my gospel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I and I love I love this because, and this is another statement that I'm very old. I served. While a uh, missionary guide was oh, yeah. the thing, so it is. It was long, long ago, and my experience with it is that when I went to the MTC, then we we were told mm -hmm. that uh, things were changing in terms of of how missionaries were were teaching the gospel, and then there were no more uh, memorized talks. So then we had to preach and teach by the spirit which was great for me at the time because I was really into education and, and well, even I'm an educator <laughs> yeah. myself. And then it was great to see that the church was, was changing yeah. right from, from a memorized uh, lesson to a lesson that involved scriptures and, and principles and doctrine, but in a way that was uh uh, spirit driven, right? Yeah. So um, I got there in the MTC. Then we had to dis dissectionate the lessons, the six lessons that were there at the time. And then when I went to a mission, then the missionaries were were teaching memorized lessons. So I had to memorize them. And then, like a year later, and a year and a half later, preach my gospel came, but it came in English, and I served in a non English speaking mission. Yeah. All the missionaries in my mission were Latin American missionaries, so it was. Oh, yeah, you were in Colombia in the years where yeah. Americans were not 
being sent there for security yeah. reasons, right? Yeah, for security Safety reasons. reasons. So, yeah. so it was just Latin American missionaries, uh, which barely understood Spanish. So it, it would be very difficult to understand also English. <laughs> so it was kind of a, a, a massive thing, but I, I, I got to really appreciate and 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 love preach my gospel as as the the proper method yeah. to be used for that time and 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 I love that twenty years later the church uh, seeing how how life uh, circumstances evolve then is also moving yeah. uh, into that direction you know like uh, when uh, we've previously mentioned that this is a a living church. So because it's a living church, then we we welcome change. We welcome uh, adjustments and, and modifications for for the greater good, right? And it's it's wonderful. Again, it, it, it's, it just draws a smile on my face, the fact that we're driving and we're in this boat, right, that has been driven by, by prophet and, and, and apostles, into this direction of improving, uh, adjusting, right, tweaking, uh, yeah. you know, like calibrating. Yeah, and and I think the, the the previous edition had already gone through some updates over time, especially on on missionary kind of key performance indicators and things like that, and also removing some language that was uh, deemed more outdated, like the use of the word investigators and things like that. But now with this full second edition, it seems like uh, hitting the reset button and a number of very very key topics although i'm looking forward to actually going through it I'm, I'm not super familiar with what the major changes are yet uh, i know that it has a lot of uh, introduction of kind of being cognizant of the current more internet online based world we live in and some of the language has been updated to for that but not just the language but the, the actual content and yeah i was uh, reflecting also on your experience going through the transition i i think i started serving right when you came back from your mission started in 2005 and I think my group was either the first or second group that got the Spanish preach my gospel the original one uh, for from the from the first day in in the field and so yeah I I knew about the missionary guide because my older brothers they served missions and I had had it at home and they were helping me prepare before I went and I was I remember seeing like in Spanish like El que enseña, el que recibe, you know, all of that kind of yes, method of yes. the one who's teaching, the one who's not. I remember the memorizing the model, first, right? The commitment model as well. And the, the first impression that I got after reviewing it with my brother, because during my mission, second year of my mission, I, I went through some health challenges. I had to go back home for a week. And I stayed uh, not at my house, but at my brother's house. He was newly married and he was my local companion. That week was fantastic. Uh, because we're really good friends. I mean, you know, Roberto, he's your brother-in-law. Yes, yes, my brother-in-law. Yeah. So, so we're and, related, by the way. We're in, in a very weird way. Daniel and I were, yeah, we have kind of a family tie that is strange yeah. because in, in other parts of the world, probably there's not such a thing as, wouldn't be any closer relatives at all. But but for Latin American cultures, we feel like we're yeah. kind of relatives in a very weird way. We're, but we are, we're way. part of the extended family. So yes. for listeners... Danny, my counterpart, he's married to my brother's wife's sister. So that would be what in Spanish we'll call concuñados. So like br brothers in law once removed. <laughs> I guess that's the best way I can translate it. <laughs> but yeah, and we go back. We're good friends from a long time as well. And life ended up putting us in the same family group. But yeah, so I lost my train of thought. But yeah, I was talking about Preach My Gospel. So I, I remember staying with my brother that second year. I was a full Preach My Gospel missionary. My brother had served like seven years before, and he was a full missionary guide, memorized type missionary. But uh, he had ditched the memorizing. He had already kind of figured out that he had to teach in his own words. But we compared and contrast. And basically, his insight was like, look, Preach My Gospel, it's, just, it's, like a, it's the same thing. It's just the pieces are scattered apart and probably so that you can arrive to the same conclusions or similar conclusions, but by the spirit. Like the, the fact that it's laid out in a different way kind of forces the student, in this case, the missionary, to figure it out, to actually study it and arrive to, to the right conclusions for themselves. And that just made it more difficult. So during that week, we practiced a lot. We did like companionship study, we would role play, teaching lessons. And I learned about teaching 
a whole lot more than in the first year of my mission because uh, the, the difference with the missionary guide is that it was really like technique focused, whereas Page and Gospel moved into a direction of spirit focused, which is great. But it is my personal belief that the spirit, the spirit when is guiding somebody to teach, it really leverages the skills. And we had seen a drop into kind of getting to know the yes. skills to use them properly. Yes. So that 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 week was really insightful. I learned the best of out of my brother's experience. He kind of got to see the flavor of how missionary work was happening at that time. And then I went back to my mission. I had so much stuff to share with my with my fellow missionaries that that made that last bit of my mission really really great. I, I so, think you, you touched a point where the the concern. Uh, as an older member, right, is the fact that the spirit cannot uh, help you teach if you don't have anything to teach, right? I, I don't know. If I don't, I don't yeah. know if I made clear with that, but yeah. But sometimes, if you rely heavily on the spirit, but there's no background information, if there's no principles or doctrine that you understand that you've pondered and studied uh, comprehensively, then the spirit will not. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I used to use an example about that. To, yeah, yeah, the example I used to use for that, and sorry that we're getting a bit kind of churchy, is the last comment I make <laughs> like this, is you know how you have the armor of God. You know, Paul taught it in, in the yes. New Testament. We also find it in the Doctrine and Covenants. And the, the symbol used for the Spirit is the sword, right? So the sword of the Spirit. And the sword is a tool, but it's of no good if the one wielding the sword doesn't have any sort of background, as you were saying, either knowledge or some degree of, of technique, right? So it's a reminder that we need a balance between both kind of training, kind of more secular or like method, and then recognizing that that's nothing without the spirit, that the actual thing that's piercing people's hearts, you know, it's, it is the spirit. <laughs> and, and I hope, I hope that this new edition of Preach My Gospel helps us moving that direction with this, not just new generation of missionaries, but this new generation of, of children of God around the world. It's a very different world than 15, 16 years ago when I was serving. And I welcome this uh, you know, inspired upgrades. And I hope they keep coming, right? That, that maybe this will move into a direction like the church handbook, which is going to be, you know, they mentioned that they're going to keep updating it uh, as it goes, right? On, on the go. Frequently, yes. Exactly. Yes. Well, so I, think I think we're running out of time. We are. So uh, I have a hard stop because otherwise my son will be left stranded in school. I need to go pick him up, my lovely 10-year-old son, whose room this is, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but it's using, been great, yes, Daniel. You're profiting. Yeah. It's been great. We, we invite uh, listeners to go to This Week in Mormons on Patreon because we'll keep discussing a couple other articles that will be Patreon exclusives. We have started doing that the last month or so uh, as exclusive content for Patreon subscribers. That's the way that you can help uh, you know, keep the project going uh, and, and reach, reach more people and ensure that it's in the long term, financially sustainable. And we appreciate, again, the invitation from the This Week in Mormons team to, to have us host today. Uh, follow us on social media, on, uh, or on Twitter, on Instagram, on, on Facebook, and, of course, on Patreon as well as TWIM or This Week in Mormons. And if you have any feedback for us or any topics you'd like us to cover in the future, just write at contact at thisweekinmormons.com. Anything to Thank close, Thank you so Danny? much. We really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for ha allowing us to have a second international edition for Twim with the twin with the Daniel twins. Yeah, uh, and uh, we hope to be invited in the future and then to continue participating in this uh, wonderful project. And 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 I love this. And and as we say I in Chile, no, no hay primera sin segunda, which means segunda. there's no first one without a second one. <laughs> and we also say, no hay segunda sin tercera, which means there's yeah. not a second one without a third one, but we're going to leave that up to the Twim team to see if there's yeah. a third and, one. And, and to the audience, right? And, and if you really the... liked it, let let the, the team know that you liked what we were doing here today. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful week. Uh, let's continue enjoying and cherishing in the gospel. Uh, we're happy to be part of this. And let's mm -hmm. see each other soon, I hope. All right. See you soon. Take care, soon. everybody. Have a lovely week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.